So good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming in uh, um, uh, bright, early, and on time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started, and others can uh, start uh, coming in a little later. So um, a couple announcements today. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce um, uh, a, new, uh, a new team and a new kind of era for um, cardiovascular medicine grand rounds. Uh, uh, we've been very fortunate with Mike Remitz uh, initially and entire Ahmad. Uh, to uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of years, uh, um, with a lot of help also from uh, uh, Carlos uh, Mena among the faculty, and then Kristen P Piscatelli, uh, uh, Corey Brennan, uh, Christy Beecher, uh, uh, Liz, uh, as well as Reese uh, and Anne, um, uh, to kind of uh, expand our offerings and our uh, visitors. Uh, who come uh, um, to cardiovascular medicine programs. And I think, as you all will probably agree with me, um, it's been a really great uh, series uh, over the last uh, year and a half to two years that I've been here that I've been seeing it. Um, and so based on that uh, background, we're, um, we're kind of continuing to build on that. Uh, and uh, um, we've asked, uh, well, we're kind of working through a pathway of allowing <coughs> our uh, emerging uh, leaders uh, among the faculty to take uh, Increasing responsibility and cycle this responsibility every couple of years to individuals. And so, um, Oyuri Anuma, who's one of our new faculty members, and Dan Friedman uh, will be partnering um, moving forward uh, uh, to, um, to lead our Grand Rounds efforts and, and, uh, and build on what Tarek and Carlos, among others, uh, have done. Um, that's number one. Number two, uh, in that, um, uh, we've kind of restructured a little bit, and, and a few of the uh, key uh, uh, features uh, are that cardiovascular medicine grand rounds is going to become a year-long um, activity uh, every Tuesday, uh, so you can mark your calendars uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, we've integrated, um, um, integrated uh, 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 speakers and integrating more fully uh, heart and vascular center uh, supported um, uh, uh, lectureships uh, we have an, uh, a Clemens lectureship for interventional cardiology that has been named, and we have others that are to be announced um, that will be integrated through the year. Um, and those will be particularly focused on, uh, on bringing in uh, uh, speakers who will be, uh, could speak to, the, um, to, to, uh, to uh, our staff as well as a larger audience. Uh, and then third, um, we're, uh, we're actually um, working uh, Ayuri and, and Dan are working with Liz, among others, uh, to uh, enhance our social media presence even further and to work with uh, Ed uh, and Perul and others in the fellowship to bring uh, at least one, if not two, fellows uh, into a leadership role to help us uh, with the development of this program moving forward. So um, exciting stuff ahead. A couple other announcements or reminders is uh, this week we have Andrew DePhilippus uh, coming from Louisville, uh, and he will be giving uh, the seminar on Wednesday. He's a candidate uh, with a strong background in, uh, uh, in uh, both uh, translational as well as outcomes research, and uh, please uh, make every effort uh, to uh, get a chance to meet with him during specific times that have been put together, and his announcements will be reminders, and those announcements will come out again today, and to uh, come to see him speak uh, at noon. On, uh, on Wednesday, and uh, Nihar will be uh, hosting him, uh, as I'll be uh, with a few others traveling to a meeting on the, on the West Coast. Um, uh, thirdly, uh, just a reminder that, uh, that uh, cardiovascular medicine grand rounds next week will be uh, done by our all, uh, fellow, um, graduating fellow, Cecilia Gallegos, and so I hope to see a very good uh, 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 um, group here in support of her, and that Dr. Uh, Gary DeSeer, our chair, will be joining us uh, for our faculty uh, meeting next Wednesday. Um, uh, he uh, uh, is uh, going to be speaking specifically around uh, issues around uh, Yale medicine, as well as departmental initiatives on compensation. That usually is a good reminder for people to come to that meeting if they can. If, uh, if uh, having a faculty meeting wasn't enough of an incentive, be good to, uh, to be there uh, next Wednesday um, for that. Uh, and so with uh, those announcements, let me now introduce Kathleen Martin, who um, has been really a pleasure uh, 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 to work with, uh, and I'm very excited uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, have her deliver what will be a new series uh, where we specifically focus on, uh, on giving our, uh, our new 
appoint, uh, uh, promoted faculty an opportunity and a venue to speak to all of us about the work that they've been doing that has led to that, uh, that honor of promotion. And so for all who aren't aware, Kathleen Martin uh, was promoted to a professor of medicine on the investigative track uh, last year. So let's give her a round of So you all know Kathleen, who's been here since 2009. But just to remind you, she uh, uh, is from Ohio originally uh, and uh, um, uh, has uh, did her PhD in, uh, in physiology and biophysics at Case Western uh, um, and uh, 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 focusing uh, on signaling molecular mechanisms. And then also then went on to a postdoc at Harvard before being recruited to start an independent laboratory at Dartmouth, where she was for several years in the departments of surgery and pharmacology and toxicology. Her focus has been on smooth muscle cell uh, differentiation and plasticity. Uh, she's made substantial um, uh, contributions to the field in that er area with, uh, with uh, major uh, uh, publications uh, in circulation, JCI, science, among others. Uh, she uh, has a very active, uh, well-funded NIH laboratory uh, that continues to move uh, uh, to further understanding of our, the plasticity of smooth muscle cell differentiation uh, and uh, epigenetic mechanisms underlying that. Um, she also is a remarkably collaborative um, and, uh, and I think a, a great mentor for others. And so uh, really something that Henry spoke to me very early when I was being recruited about the individuals to look and watch out for and has always been a very big proponent of Kathleen and her integration even as a PhD investigator within a clinical environment and how strong that was. And I think that has been a tremendous model for others and I want to promote that um, and thank her for all that. As well as the fact that she's well recognized as a, a wonderful mentor. Uh, and uh, uh, for uh, potentially pre-doctoral and postdoctoral students, uh, and increasingly, we hope, uh, for clinical, uh, uh, cl uh, clinical fellows as well. Um, that's the kind of spirit that I think we want to promote, and certainly the institution uh, agreed. And so with that uh, uh, introduction, uh, I, I welcome uh, Kathleen to give her uh, pr professorship uh, uh, talk. Uh, one last reminder, she will be uh, uh, doing a talk in December uh, this year, uh, as part of the tennis event, also uh, to uh, congratulate them. <coughs> well, thank you so much for that really kind introduction and for the opportunity to present Grand Rounds today. I'm really excited to be here. And, um, as Eric said, um, I've really been thrilled to be a basic scientist working in clinical departments from, um, from when I first began my faculty, faculty career in vascular surgery. And I hope you'll see my efforts to integrate basic discovery with clinically relevant problems. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be able to share with you what we're doing. And if you have any ideas or suggestions for collaboration, please contact me anytime. Um, so my title is Smooth Muscle Plasticity, a Double-Edged Sword. And I hope that'll become apparent because smooth muscle cell plasticity is important for many reasons, but also contributes to a lot of cardiovascular pathologies. So three of those pathologies that I'll be telling you about today are intimal hyperplasia and restenosis, transplant vasculopathy, and atherosclerosis. So as you all know, smooth muscle cells reside in the medial layer of large vessels. Um, as you can see here in a large artery, also they make up the, the walls of veins and smaller arterioles, the resistance vessels. They provide structure and conduit function to the large vessels, and their ability to contract and relax allows regulation of blood flow and pressure in response to demand. So this theme of plasticity that I'll be talking about today allows for smooth muscle cells to grow and remodel in response to demands of, of, to expand the vascular tree or contract it as necessary, um, and to repair the vascular tree. Um, but inappropriate remodeling contributes to many cardiovascular pathologies. So plasticity is a word that I'll be using a lot, and what does this really mean? It can mean the quality of being easily shaped or molded, in biology, we think of plasticity as the ability to respond to a changing environment, either at the organism or cellular level. And you, we hear the phrase a lot in terms of neural plasticity and synaptic plasticity, where we think about new connections being made or connections being reformed in learning and memory. Um, but with smooth muscle, this plasticity is really extraordinary. It's not simply a subtle rearrangement. It's a complete change in form. 
um, to assume an entirely different function that smooth muscle cells are capable of. So some of this phenotypic plasticity, um, it's smooth muscle cells I find particularly interesting because unlike cardiac and skeletal muscle cells or a cell like a neuron that terminally differentiates, once a cell commits to that specification, it can never become anything else. So cardiac myocyte will not proliferate again in, during its lifetime or become any other kind of cell. But smooth muscle cells can re-enter the cell cycle and completely reprogram their gene expression. They can become myofibroblasts, fibroblast-like cells that are involved in um, injury and repair, but can also <coughs> cause fibrosis. They, it's now appreciated they can even become macrophage-like cells, and it's now known that uh, up to 60% of the foam cells in atherosclerotic lesions are actually smooth muscle derived. Um, they can phagocytose things. They're not particularly good at it, but they, uh, they do have this macrophage property. They can also become osteochondrogenic cells in atherosclerotic lesions, and these cells uh, can form bone inside the vessels leading to calcification. They can become adipocytes in atherosclerosis and also mesenchymal stem cells. So while well, smooth muscle cells are not self-renewing stem cells per se, they have this tremendous plasticity to assume a wide range of phenotypes. And these, this spectrum of phenotypes, the whole spectrum of phenotypes is evident in atherosclerosis, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end of the talk, but also in vascular calcification, in pulmonary hypertension. And here, this is a, a nice image from Dan Greif's lab where you can see a normal pulmonary artery in the um, really dramatic uh, remodeling due to dedifferentiation and hyperplasia of the smooth muscle cells that can eventually <coughs> lead to these occlusive lesions. Um, aneurysm is another disease of inappropriate smooth muscle phenotypic modulation. Normally differentiated smooth muscle cells express a particular repertoire of contractile proteins these are down-regulated in aneurysm. There's aberrations in extracellular matrix expression. Um, and even with aging, uh, smooth muscle plasticity plays into this problem of vascular stiffness as vessels become more fibrotic and contributes to hypertension with age. I'll talk a little more about transplant vasculopathy, some of our work in this field during the talk. But smooth muscle cell um, dedifferentiation and hyperproliferation causes these diffuse lesions that limit the success of transplanted organs. And one that's uh, likely very familiar to this audience is, in particular, is restenosis following percutaneous interventions such as balloon angioplasty or stenting. This is uh, sort of the canonical. Um, model of smooth muscle dedifferentiation that most people in the field started out with, including myself. And while well, smooth muscle cells, again, normally reside in the medial layer where they're not proliferative and they're contractile and differentiated, in response to mechanical injuries, such as the overstretch injury from balloon angioplasty or a physical injury from deployment of a stent, endothelial injury, endothelial denudation, and the responding inflammatory response from platelets, macrophages, and other cells um, that sort of release growth factors in that environment. The smooth muscle cells will de differentiate, they re enter the cell cycle, start to proliferate, they repress the whole program of contractile genes, they acquire the ability to migrate into the lumen of the vessel, and once in the lumen, they continue to proliferate and secrete copious amounts of extracellular matrix, which is equivalent to a scar formation inside the lumen and can limit uh, the success of, of these procedures. We call this the synthetic phenotype due to this dramatic extracellular matrix synthesis, but they're really fibroblast-like cells, and this can occur even with stenting where there is plenty of room between the struts of the stent for the smooth muscle cells to migrate through. So a major advance around the time I started my faculty career was the um, advent of drug-eluting stents. And this has sparked my interest in smooth muscle cells. Um, these drug-eluting stents have really revolutionized revascularization, as you know, and have dramatically reduced the incidence of restenosis. They haven't completely eliminated the problem, especially in the periphery. Um, but they're now commonly widely used in the coronary arteries. And this is a slide, we, we weren't involved in this trial, but this is the data from the first in-man trial that led to the FDA approval of rapamycin eluding stents, the serolimus stents, where you can see that the incidence of restenosis was greatly diminished in patients with the drug eluding stent compared to the bare metal stent. 
Now, I know that the real world numbers are slightly higher, and in particular, <coughs> diabetic patients have more restenosis, even with drug eluding stents. And some of our work, we think, explains why this may be the case. Um, in the early days, late stent thrombosis was a major concern with drug eluding stents because um, all cells have the mTOR pathway that I'll tell you about in a minute that's targeted by this drug, rapamycin. And so you can inhibit endothelial proliferation and migration that, that delays the endothelial cells fully covering the stents. And this is an example from Renu Vermani's work in a rabbit model. And you can see particularly in the middle where they had overlapping stents where there's a higher concentration of drug, you can see the delayed <coughs> re-endothelialization. So in the early days, our efforts were aimed at understanding how rapamycin works in order to avoid some of these complications and design better stent therapeutics. <coughs> Since then, bioengineering has made tremendous advances, and the next generations of stents have better design with thinner struts, new polymers. We're on our second and third generation of rapamycin analogs, such that the um, outcomes are better. Um, but we still think it's important to understand the mechanism of rapamycin in smooth muscle cells because it's such a potent pro-differentiation agent for smooth muscle cells. Um, but it works really well in this local delivery stent platform where you can achieve really high concentrations in the target cells. But for many of the, these diseases that I just showed you examples of, um, it would be really great to be able to be able to modulate smooth muscle phenotype, but you can't get high enough systemic doses of rapamycin in order to impact the vasculature um, on a systemic level to treat diseases such as atherosclerosis or pulmonary hypertension. And part of this is because rapamycin, as you may know, is an immunosuppressant drug. And so to achieve the concentrations necessary, there's um, dose-limiting toxicity with due to immunosuppression, <coughs> adverse wound healing, now we're realizing some hyperlipidemia. Um, so we really want to harness what we can. A major research question has been understanding why is the mTOR pathway so particularly important in regulating this tremendous plasticity of smooth muscle cells, and how can we harness that um, for cardiovascular diseases? So just a little introduction to the mTOR pathway. It's not a very informative name. It stands for mechanistic target of rapamycin, so it's kind of circular logic there. Um, but this is basically a master regula regulator of all cellular growth processes. So it was best known to regulate protein synthesis and ribosome synthesis, but it's now appreciated to also regulate nucleotides and lipid synthesis, basically all the materials that a cell needs to grow. And on the flip side, it inhibits catabolic processes such as autophagy, so this balance between growth and breaking down. So in order to regulate all these growth processes, it integrates many extracellular signals. So it's a, it's a nutrient sensor for a whole host of nutrients. Everything that the cell needs to grow has a signaling input into this pathway, including stress, making sure there's not inappropriate stress levels, um, sufficient oxygen, growth factor signaling, amino acids, energy in the form of glucose and ATP. If any of these key nutrients is absent, mTOR complex 1 serves as a checkpoint function to block cell growth. And we can mimic this with the drug rapamycin. And rapamycin, I don't know if it's a little bit of trivia, if any of you know where it got its name, it comes from the, from, it was discovered in the soil of Easter Island. And the native name of Easter Island is Rapa Nui. So um, that's just a little trivia for you there. Um, now rapamycin is used, and its analogs, as you know, on drug eluding stents for transplant rejection, for acute rejection, uh, for LAM, and a disease of smooth muscle cells, and even for <coughs> cancer therapy. Um, you may see some people exploiting this pathway. This is a product called Anator P70. P70 is one of the effectors of, of the mTOR pathway. And uh, the advertising will lead you to believe that if you use this regulator of cell growth, you can bulk up like this guy. Um, this product is no longer on the market, actually. And if you read the ingredient level, it's just amino acids. So you can drink milk or have a protein shake after your workout and get the same effect. But, but the reason bodybuilders use milk after their workout or protein powder is because of the requirement for activation of this mTOR pathway. 
So we're excited about the pathway because most people in, in the science world know this pathway as a regulator of growth, and yet we found it's a really central regulator of this switch of smooth muscle phenotype, regulating epigenetic and transcriptional mechanisms to control smooth muscle fate. So this is a whole new function for the pathway that we've been exploring. And this is an example at the cellular level. This is from our very first paper in smooth muscle cells, where we saw the power of rapamycin. Uh, here's an example of what differentiated smooth muscle cells look in culture. You can see this classical elongated spindle-shaped myocyte morphology. And when you culture them with growth factors, such as PDGF, which is the major stimulus in, for restenosis, you can see this de-differentiated synthetic fibroblast-like phenotype looks very different. The cells are very large. mTOR is activated that propels the cellular growth and massive protein synthesis, especially of extracellular matrix proteins in the synthetic phenotype. These are actually cells that were treated with vehicle control or rapamycin for 48 hours. And this was our aha moment when we looked in the microscope and saw these cells that look morphologically so completely different. And we saw that something other than simply inhibiting growth and proliferation was happening here. In fact, inhibition of the mTOR pathway turns on this whole program of smooth muscle specific contractile proteins at the level of transcription. So we've spent, this is one slide summary of over 10 years of work that we spent uh, dissecting the signaling and transcriptional mechanisms. And we found that the mTOR pathway uh, regulates this differentiation response actually through the same pathway that regulates insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. So it targets insulin receptor substrate 1, and excessive nutrient signaling, as occurs in diabetes, <coughs> suppresses insulin signaling through IRS1 to cause insulin resistance. And mTOR inhibition uh, targets the same protein. We found that AKT2, which is a key protein in insulin signaling to regulate glucose homeostasis, is absolutely required for the therapeutic effect of rapamycin in vascular injury models. When we treated AKT2 knockout mice with rapamycin, we had no effect on intimal hyperplasia at all. So we think that this partly explains why the rapamycin eluding stents may not be as effective in diabetic patients if they have um, AKT2-dependent insulin resistance. We then went on to publish uh, several other stories where we looked at transcription factors downstream of AKT2, GOT6, FOXO4, and myocardin is all part of the core transcriptional machinery. And we found that AKT1 and AKT2, while they're highly homologous enzymes, have completely opposite effects on smooth muscle phenotype. One promotes proliferation and synthetic phenotype. The other promotes this differentiated phenotype. So I'll tell you about um, two other stories today. This is our AKT work in a nutshell. Um, but we found other proteins downstream of mTOR that have powerful effects on smooth muscle phenotype, one being TET2, which we found to be a master epigenetic regulator of smooth muscle plasticity, and the other being LMO7, which regulates the TGF-beta pathway, extracellular matrix, and fibrosis, and turns out to be important in atherosclerotic plaque stability. So back to this question of smooth muscle plasticity. How can you so dramatically change the cell from this myocyte phenotype to these other diverse phenotypes? It requires massive changes in gene expression, which are obviously coordinated by transcription factors. But we speculated that epigenetic regulation is another level that allows you to completely change your identity. And this can occur because epigenetics is important in how DNA is packaged. In the early days, we thought of transcription factors binding or not binding to DNA, switching it on and off. But now we know there's so much compartmentalization and regulation in the nucleus of how the DNA is packaged and localized that determines whether it can be accessible to trans transcription factors or not. And we know that there are these domains of silenced genes at the borders of the nucleus, at the outer extremes, where the DNA is tightly packaged in inaccessible heterochromatin. And this occurs through DNA methylation. The cytosine bases can be methylated. This is partly what contributes to the compaction of chromatin. There are also multiple other post-translational modifications of the histone proteins. These histones are called nucleosomes. They serve like a spool of thread around which the DNA is wound. And so you can pack these spools of thread very tightly together, or you can spread them out. 
And when it's spread out in these looping domains in active open chromatin, the transcription factors and transcriptional machinery can get in there and actually make transcripts and express those genes. So we've been exploring how this uh, regulation of chromatin organization controls gene expression. It was known that this silenced DNA is mediated by DNA methyltransferases, which methylate the DNA. But until a few years ago, it wasn't known whether this was reversible, whether you could demethylate DNA and open up chromatin. And if so, how does this happen? It turns out that this is mediated by enzymes called TET proteins. They take this 5-methylcytosine and oxidize it to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. This can be an active epigenetic mark that is found in open chromatin, or it can be sequentially broken down to completely unmethylated DNA. These are two different ways that TET enzymes promote gene expression. Um, TET proteins, it stands, the name stands for 1011 translocation, so they were first identified in these um, chromosome breaks. There are three different genes. TET1 has generated a lot of excitement because it is found to be necessary for embryonic stem cell self-renewal. TET1 is what makes a stem cell a stem cell. Whereas in hematopoietic stem cells, this different flavor of stem cells, the TET2 enzyme is absolutely required for their proper differentiation down the different lineages, and particularly the myeloid lineage. Um, and TET2 is one of the most commonly mutated enzymes in myeloid malignancies. So given what's known about these TET enzymes in stem cells and the stem-like plasticity of smooth muscle cells, we wanted to explore what these enzymes might be doing. Just as a side note, this is, um, I just, I won't go into detail today, but just mention this science paper we worked on two years ago with Ken Walsh's lab, which showed that TET2 is actually central to, it's one of the mu most common mutations in aging that accelerates atherosclerosis by clonal hematopoiesis. This is a really exciting emerging area, and, and maybe I'll get to tell you more about it another time. Um, but um, Ren Jing Lu was a great postdoc who came to my lab from the Yale Stem Cell Center, and we wanted to explore the role of TETs in smooth muscle plasticity. And she found that TET2 is expressed at really high levels in <coughs> smooth muscle cells, higher even than in embryonic stem cells. And when we looked at normal vessels, this is a, a normal, healthy mouse femoral artery, we could see that TET2 is expressed in all the nuclei, and this uh, correlates with nice myosin heavy chain expression. Um, but when we injured them, so we use a um, wire endothelial denudation model to, to cause intimal hyperplasia in the mice. You can see, uh, I hope you can see from the DAFI staining, there is a neointima here, and it's completely negative for TET2, and the mice and heavy chain is downregulated in vascular injury. We saw this in culture as well. If you just grind up an intact, healthy aorta, you see expression of TET2 in mice and heavy chain. If you culture the cells with growth factors in synthetic phenotype, the TET2 expression goes away, as does the myosin heavy chain. But if we re-differentiate them by treating with rapamycin, we can rescue the TET2 and the myosin heavy chain. We also saw this pattern of TET2 regulation in healthy versus diseased vessels in human coronary artery atherosclerosis samples. So these are from a biobank from George Toledis, a cardiothoracic surgeon here at Yale. He has graded the samples for severity of atherosclerosis based on EBG staining. And we could see um, that, again, the healthy tissue had strong TET2 expression in the nuclei, strong myosin heavy chain expression. And this uh, diminished um, with increasing severity of atherosclerosis <coughs> quantitated here. We also could see a diminishing of the 5-HMC epigenetic mark that TET2 makes. If we knock down TET2 in human coronary artery smooth muscle cells in culture, we can repress the transcription factors and the contractile proteins, so we're repressing the differentiated phenotype. Um, conversely, we activate transcription factors in genes associated with the dedifferentiated synthetic phenotype. Knocking down TET2 also causes cells to proliferate, enter S phase. And conversely, if we overexpress TET2, we increase these these pro-differentiation transcription factors and contractile proteins. The most exciting thing was when we knocked down or overexpressed TET2 locally in a model of vascular injury. So we could do this using a pleuronic gel. You can paint the gel around the outside of the vessel at the time of injury and impregnate this gel with viruses to deliver TET2 knockdown or overexpression constructs. 
when we knocked down TAT2 locally at the time of injury, we saw this massive neoentima formation. But if we overexpress TAT2, we could rescue the neoentima formation, showing that this is really powerful in this setting. Uh, we also were able to mimic this when we genetically knock down TAT2 in smooth muscle cells. We can see this uh, neoentima formation versus none in the control. So our model for how tat what TAT2 is doing is in response to injury and growth factors like PDGF, we have activation of the mTOR signaling pathway, which represses this epigenetic regulator. Conversely, when TAT2 is active or activated by rapamycin, we get this 5-HMC epigenetic mark being deposited at the regulatory regions of pro-differentiation genes. And these include the master transcriptional machinery. So by regulating the master transcription factors, it can then regulate the whole program of contractile gene expression, including the contractile proteins. At the same time, we see that TET2 promotes methylation and silencing repression of this fibroblast synthetic dedifferentiated phenotype, including the master synthetic transcription factors. We also, e even though TAT2 enzymatically only makes this single mark, we saw that multiple histone marks were also changed. These histone marks are associated with active or repressed chromatin, suggesting to us that TAT2 may be interacting with the other components of the chromatin remodeling machinery. And this is an active area of ongoing <coughs> research in my lab. Um, spearheaded by Raja Chakraborty, who's uh, found some really exciting things about how TAT2 regulates histone acetylation as well. Um, so I won't talk about that today, um, but uh, we're really excited about that project. Um, I'd like to share with you some of our unpublished work about the role of TAT2 in transplant vasculopathy. This is done by Allison O'Stryker, a really talented associate research scientist and an amazing rodent microsurgeon in my lab. So as I mentioned, trans transplant vasculopathy involves this diffuse intimal hyperplasia of the whole vascular tree of the transplanted organ. And this is in response to the ongoing low-level immune attack where the host immune system recognizes the endothelium as foreign. And so in contrast to focal lesions of atherosclerosis, you get these diffuse lesions that ultimately limit flow to the transplanted organ and can cause failure. This can occur at a rate of 5% per year in transplants, and about 30% of heart transplants will have significant vasculopathy in five years. Um, there's, it's a devastating problem with no medical therapy, so um, we're really interested to work on this. This is our working model. I'll show you the punchline first and then walk you through some of the data and some of our um, techniques that we're using to explore this. So in response to this immune endothelial damage, T cells come into the vessel. The T cell infiltration releases cytokines, including interferon gamma. And we are particularly interested in this model because our collaborators, George Levis and Jordan Pover, showed that this process is completely dependent on interferon gamma activation of mTOR. Um, and interestingly, while rapamycin <coughs> is used to prevent rejection, you can't get high enough doses of rapamycin systemically to modulate the smooth muscle feed. Um, so we really hope we can work downstream of rapamycin to understand what's going on here. Um, we've seen activation of the JAK-STAT signaling pathway, induction of microRNAs, including MIR-29, which lead to repression of TET2 expression. As TET2 is repressed, the smooth muscle cell dedifferentiate, proliferate, migrate, move into the lumen, and form these intimal hyperplastic lesions. So we, use, uh, we do use heart transplant models, which I'll show you in a minute, but mostly we use a simplified aorta graft model because it's, it's much easier. Um, we can take the, a segment of thoracic aorta from one mouse and we transplant it into the abdominal aorta of a recipient mouse. And by varying the degree of mismatch between these mouse strains, we can vary the amount of transplant vasculopathy that forms. So you can actually use the same strain and transplant <coughs> male vessel into a female recipient, and the Y antigens will cause minor mismatch. Or you can have a subtle variation or not so subtle variation in strain to get more severe vasculopathy. Um, when we do that, here's an example of a healthy mouse aorta where, again, you see tattoos staining all the nuclei. We have robust contractile protein expression. But after transplant, I hope you can see that the tattoo is um, almost gone, as is the smooth muscle contractile protein. Really profound downregulation of this pathway. 
this is a nice time course that Allison did looking at T-cell infiltration. And you can see that starting at seven days post-transplant, the, the T-cells start to infiltrate the vessel. Then by 14 days, it's really robust and continues to progress over time. You can see that this time course matches the repression of TET2 and its 5-HMC mark. So up, up to seven days, we can still see some TET2. The expression is starting to go down. By 14 days, it's dramatically down, as is the 5-HMC mark. And this coincides with interferon gamma signaling as shown by the phosphostat-3 staining. We found that this also happens in human heart transplant vasculopathy. So through Yale Pathology, we've obtained several samples from patients who've died with transplant vasculopathy. And here in a healthy control autopsy specimen, there's a little bit of intimal of uh, atherosclerosis here. But you can see the elongated nuclei of, of the medial layer have dark red staining for TET2 throughout the vessel. But in the transplant vasculopathy patient, the TET2 is dramatically downregulated. When we stain for the 5-HMC epigenetic mark, we see that it is also dramatically repressed in human transplant vasculopathy. We can mimic this by treating coronary smooth muscle cells with interferon in, in culture. It represses TET2, the major transcription factors and contractile proteins, and dramatically represses 5-HMC expression in the cells. We've used this aortographed model to transplant a TET2 knockout vessel into a wild-type host. This is a smooth muscle TET2 knockout. And you can see there is some uh, enhanced neointima formation in the absence of TET2. But what was really striking is that the medial layer is really decimated. The cells are completely uh, lost from the medial layer when TET2 is absent. So this is a new phenotype, a pro-survival phenotype in the context of immunosuppression that we haven't seen to the same extent in the vascular injury model. We see that TET2 is repressed at the mRNA level, so there's a reduction in TET2 half-life with interferon treatment. We've shown that this is mediated by microRNA MIR-29. MIR-29 is induced by interferon as well as by transplant vasculopathy. You can see MIR-29 throughout the, the medial layer of the transplant. And interestingly, MIR-29 has been shown to be a marker of acute rejection in human transplants. So it's interesting that this may indicate that TET2 repression really is important in human uh, transplant rejection. So we've explored anti-MIR-23 as a therapy. Um, we were able to rescue TET2 expression, but it didn't rescue the vasculopathy. And this because microRNAs tend to have many uh, targets and off-target effects made this not a great therapeutic scenario, but the good news is we're harnessing something as simple as vitamin C to rescue TET2 activity. This is a really exciting area of clinical investigation in the cancer field, and we're excited that we may be able to explore this in the transplant field. So in 2013, two papers came out that showed that vitamin C directly activates <coughs> TET enzymes in culture and in vivo. And more recently, several groups have shown that you can rescue TET activity in cancer, mouse cancer models with dramatic effects, including in leukemia, where, as I mentioned, TET2 is really important in myeloid differentiation, and in kidney <coughs> models. There are multiple clinical trials of injected IV ascorbic acid going on in humans. There's been some exciting success, even as a single agent in ovarian cancer, <coughs> and a lot of interest in uh, combination therapy with other traditional therapeutics where it enhances, uh, greatly enhances responses and improves immunotherapy. So you may remember back in the day, Linus Pauling was a big advocate of vitamin C and this caught a lot of flack when people couldn't replicate it. And part of that was the method of delivery. So there's a limit to the systemic level you can reach with oral vitamin C therapy. You can get much higher levels with intravenous therapy, and that's what Linus Pauling was doing. And that's what investigators have returned to this intravenous therapy. We've used this approach. We've actually used IP injection of vitamin C in the mice and have been really excited that we can rescue the transplant vasculopathy in this aortograft model. So here, we're using a trick where we use uh, GFP to permanently label smooth muscle cells in the vessel. These are all pictures of vessels post-transplant. And so in the control situation, the smooth muscle cells in the media are, are dying. You don't see much GFP expression here anymore. 
Uh, whereas in the vitamin C treated mice, you can see a robust uh, original medial layer is still present. <clears throat> I hope you can also see that there's much less intimal hyperplasia in the vitamin C treated compared to the control versus in the TET2 knockout mice. So because TET2 is the target of vitamin C, if you genetically deplete it, vitamin C has no effect in the knockout mice. And you can see, in fact, the severe neointima in the TET2 knockout mice. Uh, we can all see this, the, the opposite effect if you measure the medial area. If you zoom in on these sections, you can see that we've also rescued 5-HMC expression in the medial layer with the vitamin C treatment. So we're excited. We're, this is a very preliminary hot off the press experiment. We're continuing these experiments and hope that um, because this is safe in humans, that this may be something that we could try sometime sooner than later. Um, exploring other mechanisms with this genetic fate mapping or lineage tracing may tell us something else to identify other new targets for transplant vasculopathy. So you can see in these pretty pictures, these are mice where smooth muscle cells have been permanently marked with green fluorescent protein. And you can see this nice staining of the medial layer in the untransplanted aorta. All the other cells in the mice are red. Um, so this allows us to follow the fate of smooth muscle cells as they undergo this plasticity and change their phenotype. No matter what happens to their gene expression, they stay green. <coughs> and you can see that over time, post-transplant, these green cells are contributing to the neointima. And if you look closely, this yellow arrow is pointing to a single green cell that we were able to capture at one week post-transplant entering the lumen. So we're really <coughs> excited. Can we isolate these cells and learn what is special about that cell and how can we target that cell to prevent this process from happening? So um, here's a zoomed in picture from, from another section. You can see some green cells that have just entered the lumen. And one of these green cells is marked red. In this case, that's marking a proliferative cell that's giving rise to a lesion, which we speculate may be a clonal lesion. So how do we know if this is a clonal lesion? Is it really one single cell that's the culprit here? We're exploring this with rainbow mouse technology. And so this is using a mouse that was um, given to us by our collaborator, Dan Greif. You can use a smooth muscle promoter to randomly label smooth muscle cells in the vessel wall, one of three different colors, red, orange, or blue. So um, Dan's lab has optimized this so that you get truly random pattern of marking of the vessel. And then we can follow, if we transplant this vessel, what color ends up in the, in, in the neointima. If a single cell comes out and clonally expands to form the whole lesion, we should see that the lesion is all of one color. If any old cell can come out, and if in fact multiple cells come out and all contribute to the lesion, we should see this rainbow multi-random colored lesion. So what do we see? Here's an example of a labeled but untransplanted aorta. And you can see we have a nice random mixing of red, orange, and blue. When we, this is one example of transplant. And you can see these very large patches that are all one color suggesting that these single cells, something special about that cell, is allowing it to enter the lumen to clonally expand and, and cause this lesion. So here you can see this big patch of blue that extends all the way around. And here's another patch of red where another cell came out. And in another example, here again, we see a big patch of blue. We see a patch of red, another patch of blue, patch of orange. So this suggests that there is something special about these cells that are forming the lesion. And if we can understand what that is, we may be able to target it. So we're currently working with our, our newest faculty member in the research center, David Van Dyke, to use a single cell RNA sequencing approach so that we're going to sequence these transplanted vessels over time, seven days, 10 days, and 14 days. David has these beautiful analysis methods where you can follow a population of cells and look at how its gene expression is changing over time. So even if we can't capture that one single cell, which may be a bit of a needle in a haystack, although we think we may be right at the limit of resolution where we can detect it, we hope that we can detect patterns of what this cell is doing as it expands in the lumen, as well as what's going on in the cells in the media may uncover new targets to treat this disease. 
Another method we're using, uh, so this aorta graft model is simple and cool, but it's not the same as looking at actual coronary arteries. And so um, Allison in my lab is doing these heart transplants where she transplants a second heart into the abdominal aorta and vena cava. So only the left atrium and ventricle are connected to the circulation, but the heart beats and the coronaries, coronaries are perfused with oxygenated blood in the right direction. Um, and so this is a movie that shows you what it looks like. So here, if there's no mismatch, you can see this is the heart nestled among the intestines, beating nicely. You can see it's nicely perfused. It does beat more slowly than the native heart. Um, but in, conversely, you can see um, if we have a mismatch, you can see that this heart has some gray areas where it's not well perfused. It's beating much more slowly, more arrhythmically. And the, the cool thing about this model is because it's transplanted in the aorta, you can just palpate the abdomen and feel this heartbeat and see how well the transplanted heart is doing and when it's about to fail. You can also do echo on the native heart and the transplanted heart, um, a lot of cool things. And uh, with Zen Wu's help, if I can advance this. Oh, here we go. We can even do micro CT on these transplanted hearts. And here you can see um, this is a major mismatch model. There's some stenosis here in this coronary artery. With minor mismatch, you can see a neointima forming. We can use this genetic lineage tracing where here you can see these little uh, specks of green here. I hope you can see them. The coronary, the smooth muscle cells of the coronary arteries are green where all other cells, including all these cardiac myocytes, are red, we can dissociate the heart into single cells, use fluorescent-activated cell sorting to pull out the green smooth muscle cells, and then we can do transcriptomics, we can do genome-wide measurement of what's going on with the epigenome. So this is an area of research that we're really excited about. And this is just showing that we can isolate the green cells versus the not green cells and see smooth muscle versus cardiomyocyte-specific patterns of gene expression. So this is a tool that we're, we're using going forward. So, so far I've told you about um, this tattoo story, that tattoo is a master epigenetic regulator of um, the differentiated phenotype. Um, we're looking at its role in atherosclerosis, in vascular development, in chromatin remodeling. Um, now, in just the last couple minutes, I'll tell you about this protein called LMO7, which is also down of, downstream of mTOR. We don't understand the mechanics quite as clearly, but it regulates this synthetic phenotype, the extracellular matrix and plaque stability. So this is where the double-edged sword comes in. So this smooth muscle plasticity allows new vessels to form, vessels to remodel in response to pressure and demand, repair of vascular injury. Um, in atherosclerosis, it's a good and a bad thing. So this smooth muscle plasticity <laughs> contributes to the lesion, but also allows for formation of the fibrous cap that stabilizes the lesion. And this is work from Yi Shi, and, uh, the senior member of my lab. Um, we discovered this protein, LMO7. It has no catalytic functions, but four different protein-protein interaction domains. So it's a scaffold for bringing proteins together. Um, particularly, they associate with the cytoskeleton and the transcriptional machinery. When he made a smooth muscle-specific knockout of LMO7, so basically nothing was known about this protein in smooth muscle. It has suggestions of a role in cardiac myocyte development or skeletal muscle development. We decided to look what it does in smooth muscle, and when it's missing, you get a dramatic neointimal hyperplasia in response to vascular injury with excessive extracellular matrix formation. Um, we saw this is staining for TGF beta in a downstream effector. You can see again these injured vessels lacking LMO7 have huge neointima, outward remodeling, and very high levels of TGF beta expression, suggesting that LMO7 normally inhibits TGF beta signaling. And in fact, if you inhibit TGF beta with a receptor antagonist post injury, you can completely block this phenotype. So, our model this is a lot of work, but a simplified model is that TGF beta signaling in wound healing, TGF beta is a major master regulator of extracellular matrix synthesis that allows for collagen deposition and repair. This goes through SMAD3 signaling. But it has multiple layers of both positive feedback that amplifies TGF beta signaling in early phases of wound repair and negative feedback that terminates and limits wound repair. So TGF beta, and when it reaches sufficiently high concentrations, we found turns on its own off switch in the form of LMO7. 
So TGF beta induction of LMO7 leads to the resolution of wound healing by dampening this whole pathway. We found that this is true in humans as well, and I'll just, I apologize, I'll show the data really quickly for the sake of time, but we've seen that LMO7 is also induced in human intimal hyperplasia, and we see this inverse relationship between LMO7 level and TGF beta signaling in two different human diseases. So we see this again in human transplant vasculopathy in, in coronaries, where LMO7 is induced with intimal hyperplasia and this opposite relationship with the TGF beta signaling. And in AV fistula, with help from Alan Dardick's lab, we were able to see in human intimal hyperplasia, again, upregulation of LMO7, but opposite regulation of TGF beta signaling. Now, when we looked at an atherosclerotic model, so this is unpublished work in progress, we saw dramatic effects of LMO7 on atherosclerotic plaque composition. So the plaques were not different in size, but if you look at the necrotic core, the necrotic core is smaller, and most notably, the fibrous cap is significantly thicker than the control lesion, and this is an important determinant of plaque stability. We saw that TGF beta signaling was also upregulated in these LMO7 knockout mice, and um, consequently, collagen was highly upregulated in these lesions, particularly in the, in the fibrous cap area to help promote cap stability. We also use the lineage uh, tracing approach here to look at these lesions. Here again, this is smooth muscle actin staining. You can see the nice robust fibrous cap in this lesion as compared to the control where it's much thinner. If we look at CD68 as a marker of inflammatory macrophages, in the control lesion, you can see these macrophages throughout the fibrous cap and particularly at the shoulder region where plaques tend to be vulnerable. In the control, you can see the pattern of the CD68 staining is much different with far fewer staining in the cap, suggesting a more stable cap. <coughs> also, this green signal is again tracing the smooth muscle fate. And here you can see from the DAPI staining that the lesions are again similar in size, but there are many more green smooth muscle derived cells in this lesion in the absence of LMO7 compared to the control. And interesting work that just came out of Stanford uh, last year uh, suggests that more smooth muscle cells in the lesion is actually atheroprotective. Initially, we thought that smooth muscle infiltration of the lesion was a bad thing, um, but we're starting to see, and primarily because of this fibrous cap contribution, that smooth muscle cell in the lesion seems to be more protective. Um, and so does this translate to humans? So with the help of our collaborator, Lars Magdefessel, who has access to two very large biobanks of human carotid endarterectomy samples uh, from both the Karolinska and Munich biobanks, um, this is an example of some of his samples where they're able to get control and atherosclerotic regions from the same vessel, from the same patient. They saw that LMO7 was induced almost sixfold in the atherosclerotic region versus the control. But more importantly, they have a biobank of samples that are unstable or ruptured versus stable lesions. And they were able to see an increase of LMO7 in the ruptured lesions, suggesting that when LMO7 is high and TGF beta is low, you have less plaque stability. So we're currently working to understand how it is that LMO7 regulates TGF beta and other signaling that influences smooth muscle fate in, in the lesions. So it can influence smooth muscle transition to this inflammatory macrophage phenotype in a beneficial way, as well as to this fibrotic cap forming phenotype. So we hope to characterize these by single cell RNA-seq as well, as well as to test whether these lesions actually are more stable in a new model of plaque rupture. So in summary, I've shown you uh, three pathways downstream of this important target of rapamycin pathway that all influence smooth muscle plasticity, the TET2 epigenetic regulator, uh, AKT2 regulation of transcription factors, and LMO7 regulation of the fibrotic phenotype. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, my fantastic team, um, some of whom are here today, um, who contributed to this work. Allison, the transplant vasculopathy, Yi, the LMO7, Ren Jing, who now has her own lab in Sydney, did the initial TET2 work. And uh, I see Raja way in the back, who's doing the TET2 epigenetic work. And uh, Min is here helping with TET2 and atherosclerosis and other studies. Um, 
And thanks to my many collaborators, as you see, um, when I started making this list, I was impressed by how many um, people in this room have actually helped with this, with this work. And I'm really grateful to everyone for their contributions and support, particularly to John Wa, my fellow faculty member and partner in crime and partner in life who has an adjoining lab. We collaborate a lot. Um, we're even showing that platelets and smooth muscle cells have all kinds of interesting interactions. Um, and uh, a special <coughs> thanks to uh, Patrick Valliger and Vince from his lab who's here. Uh, we couldn't do this epigenetic work without their help. Um, Pat's a, a terrific um, clinician, a great individual and friend, and I, I'd like to thank any of you who may know um, Patrick from your practice. We, we thank you from the bottom of, of our heart uh, for your taking good care of him in his time of need. Um, and, and once again, I'm really grateful to be a basic scientist doing what I hope is translationally relevant work. So if you have any ideas for how we can intersect to study smooth muscle or other cardiovascular disease, I'm also interested in cardiometabolic disease and fibrosis in general. Please let me know. And uh, thanks for your, in, um, for your kind attention, and I'll take any questions. Kathy, um, amazing work, and congratulations again on your promotion. So back to the title of your talk, Plasticity is Double-Edged Sword, makes perfect sense. Um, the positive side of plasticity would be potentially to take a cell that is not typically plastic and drive it, for example, a cardiomyocyte, when we might want to extend those cells. So I wonder if, if you have a sense of why cells like SMCs and myeloid cells are so plastic. I mean, you, you describe the mechanism, but why are they and why other cells are not? I mean, what fundamentally, you know, chromatin action, mm -hmm. et cetera, but some cells are and some cells aren't. It's a great question, and I think part of what makes smooth muscle cells so special and have this plasticity is their reliance on KLF4. So I didn't go into a lot of detail, but I showed KLF4 in some of our slides is a master regulator of smooth muscle D differentiation. And you may recognize KLF4 is one of the four Yamanaka factors that can reprogram cells into induced pluripotent stem cells. And so it may be that this, that expressing what's essentially a stem cell gene, even though they aren't true stem cells, allows them to have this plasticity. Smooth muscle cells also reactivate OCT4 in the case of some of these transitions in atherosclerosis, which is another master pluripotency gene. And so I think it may be how these stem cell genes, if they're truly packed away in heterochromatin, never to be seen again, those cell types may not be able to access this plasticity. But cells that are able to tune into these stem cell transcription factors may be able, I think that's what allows them to change their phenotype. And that's part of what, what we're trying to explore with our epigenetic mechanisms. I mean, you think it's unlockable in those words? Um, I don't think it's unlockable because if you can make you can make induced pluripotent stem cells from any cell these days if you can forcibly re-express those transcription factors. So that's an artificial technical intervention. But if the cell itself is able through signaling pathways to access that pluripotency program, I think that's the key to what kinds of cells can have this inherent plasticity versus others that are terminally committed to one, permanently to one fate. Larry, uh, can I have one question? Okay. Okay. It's a terrific work, Kathy. <clears throat> too much, too little can always be an issue. So are there times that tattoo maybe needs to turn off in terms of normal holding stasis and driving it with ascorbic acid outside of the target area, are there issues that we should that, That's a good question as well. We This is a kind of a new frontier, and we, we, we don't really know. I think certainly in terms of wound repair and healing, smooth muscle needs to turn it off in, either, in order for cells to proliferate, to make matrix. And whether this is a component of normal myofibroblast biology, whether this extends to all wound healing, or whether it's unique to the vasculature, we don't know yet. But that could be, that could be a caveat. And um, so far in the cancer trials, we haven't seen anything. But again, that's a context of 
sort of last resort at the moment where the most urgent need is the cancer therapy, but whether it would have long-term consequences is a good question. We don't know. I think the good thing is that vitamin C is turned over very rapidly, and so you need to have consistent IV therapy to keep it at those high levels. So you may be able to you know, use it transiently and then back off once you have the therapeutic effect that you need. Kathy, uh, really uh, fantastic, and I think uh, hopefully for our trainees who see the opportunities that this, uh, that, that, the future relationships that can happen in a place like Yale, uh, in a place like our section, uh, the opportunities that we can place. I guess the question maybe to end the program for time is uh, there's a lot of excitement around the role of different uh, nutritional strategies, particularly from the past, around uh, and maybe it's activity Have you um, any interest or have you, in fact, pursued kind of those uh, nutritional approaches to alleviating some of the effects of Yeah, that's a fascinating question. And I, I haven't directly pursued it, but I, I try to follow the literature. And you may know that caloric restriction, many people think that that's the answer to aging is long-term caloric restriction. And, and a large part of that is through inhibition of the mTOR pathway. And so, and also because I briefly alluded to the connection with hypernutrition and diabetes is also mediated through the mTOR pathway. I do think that good nutrition is key to a lot of cardiovascular and cardiometabolic disease prevention. A lot of that may be mTOR mediated and our, our, our Western diet is not good in terms of mTOR signaling. So I do think that's a strategy that's been underexplored. You can also inhibit, aside from things like rapamycin, you can simply deplete essential amino acids like leucine and completely inhibit the mTOR pathway. So there are strategies. So on the one hand, you have sort of the high-protein diet, the bodybuilding pro-mTOR strategy. On the other hand, you have the... Um, which is sort of a concern for the low, the opposite of low carb is super high protein. And I do have a little bit of concern that long term this might be an issue of what are the consequences of long term hyper mTOR activation. And so the flip side of that is the caloric restriction. Periods of things like intermittent fasting might be good. Um, I think there is some data that sort of cyclic activity of mTOR is what we're meant to have, and that may go along with things like intermittent fasting. Because the just long time massive caloric restriction, while in animal models shows that it definitely promotes lifespan, it's not a very livable mechanism for people. It's a very interesting strategy people. to even pursue in, in, in evaluation using the model 2000. So, thanks yeah. everyone uh, for coming.